One of the fun things to do when you're traveling in England is to get out into the countryside away from London and visit some of the nearby areas. And one of the most convenient ways to do that is by train, commuter train, intercity train. You can go to Windsor, Bath. In this case, we're going to Chester today. It's a few hours by train and we'll be going to a different part of the country and a chance to see an old medieval town of Chester. You want to be sure to take the intercity train when you're traveling some distance in Great Britain. It's the higher quality and you can either go first class or second class on the intercity and it'll get you from London to Chester in about two and a half hours. We're doing this as a day trip. You might want to go to Chester and spend a night in the neighborhood or in our case we're just taking the train from London, spend the day in Chester and then turn around in the evening and go back to London. It's a long day but as you'll see it's got its rewards because Chester is an incredible place. The heart of town is Victorian and Tudor and Gothic architecture all blended together and one of the most distinctive features of town are the two levels of shopping sidewalks called the Rows. It's a city of balconies. There's the main shopping level, the beautiful Tudor half-timbered fronts, and then there's the second level of shops, and these have been here like this for many hundreds of years. Nobody is quite sure exactly when it was first built or exactly why it was built this way, but it certainly functions today to create a very pleasant town environment. There's no cars allowed in the center of town here, so it's strictly for the pedestrians and public buses and taxis. So it's very easy to get around. It's a small town, and it's ideal for walking. And look at these rows. You walk right up the steps to the second level of shops. So what we have is a medieval split-level shopping mall. You're watching World Traveler presented by the Hawaii Geographic Society. And this is a preview of an upcoming tour that we'll be conducting of the British Isles in July of 95. The trip is open to the public and we'll be traveling from the south of England up to Scotland and over to Ireland and spending two to three days in each place that we visit. In each place that we go, we always have the services of a local tour guide. And now we're gonna turn you over to the Chester guide who's gonna take us through town. Welcome to Chester. My name is Tom Hand, one of the local tour guides, and we're standing in part of the Roman amphitheater of Chester. When the Romans were here, this amphitheater had enough seating for 7,000 people. This was the largest Roman amphitheater in Great Britain. Diva, as the Romans called Chester, had enough accommodation for 6,000 troops. And just recently, in the last 10 years, with new archaeological digs and evidence coming to light, we now realize there would have been a civilian population of approximately 7,000 people. Behind the visitor center two or three years ago, during an archaeological dig, we found there the remains of Roman workshops and retail outlets. This is the amphitheater as it was, and we were standing approximately here. And also from here, the Romans sent parties up to build Hadrian's Wall. This was a massive military encampment here, mm -hmm. and remained so for nearly 300 years. Now, Tom, what sort of activities would happen in the Roman amphitheater? One activity that would not happen here, we never threw the Christians to the lines. We've no archaeological evidence whatsoever. But we do know it would have been used for sports, racing, javelin throwing, combat, wrestling, etc. So forget all the Hollywood stuff about the lions and the tigers, etc. Gladiators, possibly. This is the remains of the Roman tower, the Southeast Angle Tower. And the Roman walls turned right and ran along what is now Pepper Street. This is only part of our fortifications. I'm actually now standing in part of the Roman ditch, which would have been about 20 foot wide 
and possibly nine to 12 foot deep, a dry ditch. And in the bottom of the ditch would have been sharpened stakes to catch the enemy as they ran down into the ditch. But the Romans were very good builders. They basically, if you look at the construction, the center is a load of rubble and the outer stones, they've all been dressed, which was quite common uh -huh. uh, way to manufacture and build things here. The Normans used it as well in their great cathedrals. But the Romans were very good builders. They basically, if you look at the construction, the center is a load of rubble and the outer stones, they've all been dressed, which was quite common uh -huh. uh, way to manufacture and build things here. The Normans used it as well in their great cathedrals. The 1500s, the gate was locked and barred on the orders of an alderman of the city. His daughter eloped through the gate. And in the city records, it tells us that the Wolf Gate, Pepper Gate, or New Gate, as it's known, will be locked and barred to stop any other scurvy knave running off with the gentleman's daughter. The Roman walls, and later on to our right, the medieval walls, they were, of course, protective of the city and the fortress. Cheshire later on, and the city of Chester during the rule of the Normans from 1092 onwards, became the buffer state between England and Wales. And we did have various rules about the Welsh in our city. For example, no Welshman was permitted to remain in the city after curfew. Any Welshman found in the city after curfew bell had rung would be arrested. Three or more, we deemed they were plotting the overthrow of the Earl of Chester and they would be executed. The six small black and white houses, the terrace, they're known as the nine old houses. There used to be nine arms houses, ALMS, run by the various parishes in the city and retired personnel would go and live there and be looked after by the parish authorities. They're still used as arms houses, and of course, now the local social services and the church authorities ensure the health and well-being of the people living in those houses. The larger building was built in 1881, and the inscription, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. That inscription was found on a Roman coin on the site when they started building and to commemorate the fact it was put on the front of the building. Rather appropriate these days, that building is now a dental surgery. <laughs> these ruins down here, it is not a Roman building. It is in fact odds and ends, if you like, pillars, capitals, bases of various Roman buildings we found in the city and they were placed here by the Parks Department and the reconstruction of a Roman hypercost. Underneath the buildings within the city, we do have a number of Roman hypercost and other Roman remains in the shops, which you can, in fact, as a visitor, ask permission to go and see. Albion Street was one of the finest pieces of work in the city on conservation. The buildings were built just over 100 years ago to house the artificers and the craftsmen, mainly of the railway companies. And a few years back, the city fathers, together with private enterprise, they gutted the houses and left the exterior, but brought the interiors right up to the 20th century standards. And are there the people living there? People are living there. It's a mixture of rented accommodation. You can buy these houses, very much sought after and really one of the nice little communities within the city centre. The Albion Inn, which is on the corner, is really the last true village pub left in the city centre. It is a true community pub. Yeah. This is the true back-to-back -back housing. If any of you have ever watched Coronation Street, these are the type of houses that uh, were quite numerous at one time here in England. The reason, of course, is a very small land mass and a very large population. But to find out more of the story of the Cheshire Cat, I suggest you come and spend some time here. The defensive walls of the 
city of Chester were enlarged by the Saxons somewhere around about 900. Standing on the site of one of the defensive towers, this part of the wall, of course, is the extension built by the Saxons around about the 900. Behind me is a suspension bridge, and over my right shoulder, the large building was once the Bishop's Palace of Chester. Beautiful Georgian building, now a listed building, but this is all built of local sandstone. In fact, the whole city sits upon a bed of sandstone, which is 50 foot above sea level. That bridge, up until 1833, was the only crossing from England across the River Dee, and about six miles along the road is the border with Wales. All traders and travellers going to or from Wales came through Chester, the bottleneck, and we collected the taxes off everybody. This is Bridge Place, which is part of the Georgian development of Chester. The city itself is a mixture of architecture from Norman right up to the 20th century. These particular houses were built in the 1700s. Again, a conservation area, as now is the whole of the city. Although we have a lot of what appear to be Georgian houses, some, in fact, are only false Georgian fronts. As you can see, across the way is the Burr and Billet, the black and white building, built in 1664. And to the right of it is the tea rooms. That building is not Georgian. It's a mock Georgian front. We're now in Eastgate Street, which in the Roman period was the main street in the Roman fortress of Diva. And in those days, it was much wider than it is today. The Eastgate in Roman times was in fact two arches, each arch slightly wider than the present day arch. And the architecture here is a mixture of Victorian, Edwardian, Georgian back in the 1700s, and right back to some buildings going back to the 15 and 1600s. After the Civil War ended back in the 1640s, a lot of rebuilding took place in Chester, and also, in some cases, only the front of buildings were taken down and altered. A lot of the buildings behind me have false Georgian or Victorian frontages, and the rest of the buildings are, in fact, wooden buildings going back to the 14 and 1500. This Gothic frontage, of course, is Victorian. Got one of Chester's many inns. You'll never go thirsty in this city of ours. There are, of course, now less inns than there were in the heyday of it being a coaching city. And, of course, the wealth of Chester has been founded on trade and visitors and farming. And although we're no longer a port, a lot of the merchants actually had their own ships which sailed from Liverpool to the New World. This is the 14th century Abbey Gateway, going into what is now the Cathedral Church of Chester. It was at one time St. Werberg's Abbey. We're now in the Abbey Square with its collection of beautiful and very well-maintained Georgian buildings, although number two and number three, again, are a false Georgian front on the old gateway. To the left of the archway is now Barclays Bank, but that in the days of the great Benedictine Abbey here was the abbot's lodgings and the great wine cellar. The cathedral itself started off in 1092 as a Benedictine Abbey. And of course, this year, 1992, we will be celebrating its 900th anniversary. We're very lucky here in Chester that we are still using the original outbuildings of the abbey for the original purpose, the refectory to dine in. You can actually go and dine where the monks dined. The chapter house where the monks held their chapter meetings. The dean and chapter still meet there. And of course, the main body of the church for worship. Prior to this building being erected, there was a church on the site which moved in 907. So for well over a thousand years, we know daily Christian worship has been carried out 
in this area. We're now in the refectory of Chester Cathedral, the dining room for the monks when this was a monastery. You can still see catering for the modern day pilgrim. We like to think that people that come here to the Cathedral of Chester, they come on a pilgrimage as well as visitors to our city and our cathedral. The ceiling, of course, is quite modern. It was only built in 1939. But the rest of the fabric is part of the old monastic building dating back to the 11, 1200s. We're now in Chester Cathedral proper at the west end of the cathedral. The building itself, of course, has many styles of architecture, predominantly Norman, as it was started in 1092. But we have to stop and remember that the monks modernized their abbey in the 1200s and the late 1300s. And even one part, they did in fact take over a parish church to enlarge their monastery. We'll now leave here and walk down into the choir stalls, which must be the finest carved choir stalls in the country. Beautiful medieval carvings, the canopies over the choir stalls. The choir stalls themselves are called the Miserdi Courts, the seats of mercy or pity. And the idea of the canopy was to give the older and sometimes more powerful monks a wee bit of comfort during the services. Remembering, of course, there was no heating in here and very little glass at the beginning. The seats themselves are very highly decorative with carving. The model story behind this carving is if you drink too much ale or alcohol, you end up evil like the devil and not good like the priest. The head of the figure is a clergyman and yet his haunches and feet are the cloven hooves of the devil. It's built of oak, and the oak came from the Baltic. As the, the monks and the local lords and the king were having an argument as to how much wood they could take from the local forest. <laughs> Basically Norman, the building. It took about 300 years to build. The tapping noise of the stonemasons preparing the windows for the new stained glass windows which are being put in this year. They've been donated by the Duke of Westminster who of course lives in Chester. The adjacent cloister is also early Gothic and provides a calm place for the clergy to relax and meditate in prayer. The elaborate fan vaulting of the ceiling extends even to the outer doorway areas of the church. All in all, the Cathedral of Chester is one of the finest examples of British Perpendicular Gothic with the earlier Norman foundations. With these buildings across the road, they all date from the late 1800s, 1898, they were done. But even the Victorians were trying to make the city look old. Chester's Town Hall, built in 1869, it replaces the building which burnt down in 1862 on New Year's Eve of that year. And the bottom part of the building was originally the city police headquarters, with on the next floor up the law courts, the magistrates' courts, and above that again, the council chamber and the Lord Mayor's apartment. The Bluebell restaurant of Chester, Northgate Street, first licensed in 1494 when it was in fact one of the inns. Later on it became a coaching inn and we know from our old records that you could have a room in here for a penny a night if you didn't mind sharing with other passengers off the coach. No bed, no seats, just a room. And it is one of the finest houses of the 1400s period. We're now looking at the Roman wall of Chester. This part of the wall dates back, as far as we can tell, to around about 200 AD. What is now the canal started off life as the dry ditch to protect the Roman fortress. And only in the 1700s they dug out the rubbish of centuries to make it into a canal. The original Roman wall wasn't actually built of stone. As you'll see in a few moments, it was actually built of 
turf and logs. And of course, the canal these days here is used for holiday boating. It's only three or four foot deep, that's why it looks so muddy. And the canal starts off in North Wales at Clangothland, meanders through Wales, down through Whitchurch in Shropshire, through Chester, and then goes down and ends up, it tells me, a port on the banks of the River Mersey. Yeah. Yeah. People like to use the city walls as a jogging track. The city authorities now were trying to stop it because the pounding of the feet is damaging the wall. The King Charles Tower, or as it's also known, the Phoenix Tower, from the symbol of the Phoenix of the guilds of the city, King Charles I is reputed to have stood upon this tower in 1645 and watched his army defeated at the Battle of Roughton Moor, which is two miles outside the city. The king was eventually caught, and the city held out from September 1645 through to February, March of 1646, and eventually surrendered through starvation. The population here during the Civil War were reduced to eating anything that walked or flew. Rats, cats, mice, horses, birds. If it had flesh on it, you could eat it. Because of the Civil War, Chester was very badly damaged, and we were a royalist city, and we were heavily fined and also, one of the other things that happened was trade decreased at that time. Just to my left is an earth mound, and that is the original Roman wall of Chester, which was built of turf and logs. And then later on, the Romans built the stone wall in front of the turf wall. First and foremost, before the Romans arrived here, we had, in fact, a local population. And the Romans chose Chester as a fortress because it was easily defended. The River Dee flo flowed on three sides. Later on, after the Romans had gone, the Saxons appeared here. The Vikings attacked the place, and later on, some Vikings settled here. Then, of course, the Normans arrived in the 10 hundreds. You all heard of 1066 and all that. 1092 onwards, Chester was an independent state and we were in fact the buffer state between England and Wales. Gradually intermarriage took place, the city prospered once peace had been restored even though we still have a circuit of the walls feet under two miles in circumference. During the last war we had the friendly invasion of the American troops here to Cheshire. General Patton was based outside of the city few miles outside at Piva, and in fact they still have in Piva Hall the American flag flying which was his headquarters. Nowadays we welcome people with open arms and in many ways living in the city itself to me it's more like a village than a city. These walking tours are offered every day during the summer season and you can find them right at the information office there in the heart of town in Chester. In our case, we were the only ones who showed up for the tour that day, but Tom was kind enough to take us along on a private, exclusive look at Chester, and we hope you enjoyed that personal and intimate view of this historic city.